a special presentation of LOBM with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, uh, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, along with my co-host, Dr. Larry Garrity, <laughs> who is also from La Sierra and been involved in uh, archaeology for decades, <laughs> many <True>. decades. Um, <laughs> and we are joined uh, for this edition by Dr. Kent Bramlett, Assistant Professor of Archaeology and the History of Antiquity also at La Sierra, and the curator for our uh, labs mm -hmm. at the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology. Mm -hmm. And we're talking for three episodes about my favorite artifact. Mm -hmm. And we've had occasion to talk about lamps. This was Larry's favorite. We'll have occasion to talk about stoneware. That mm -hmm. will be mine. Um, but we want to talk about cooking pots. Now, Kent, you're going to have to explain this. Um, I, I, is it the chef in you that uh, makes you interested <laughs> in cooking pots? Uh, what is it that allows cooking pots to rise to the top of the heap <laughs> as your favorite uh, artifact? Well, I like cooking pots because uh, they broke easily. <laughs> so, okay. Sounds yeah. like a true archaeologist. <laughs> right. right. It, it's, it's, you know, I deal with pottery and, and identifying how the changes uh, can be lined up over time. Mm -hmm. and it helps us identify the periods that we're excavating. Cooking pots are the best things to look at, best kind of pottery to look at. So, so some things didn't break as often, right. these, what, because they weren't used well, as often? Think of these big or? storage jars. They would put them in the back of the, of the house and it'd be like a pantry, you know, partly buried in the From ground. From generation to generation, they, right? Yeah, they can last yeah. over 100 years, we know, from yeah. ethnographic studies in Cyprus. We know from our excavations, and our excavations that there's yeah. at least 100, maybe 150 years between yeah. a couple of a couple of these large storage jars, stand, what, about three feet tall, mm -hmm. sitting right next to each other. Yep. And clearly from we different one from the Persian period, period another from the Hellenistic. <laughs> from yeah. Persians to Greeks, and they're being used contemporaneously. Right, right. right. But cooking mm -hmm. pods, because of the thermal stress, you know, the heating and cooling, heating and mm -hmm. cooling, over the fire tends to make micro cracks which then eventually expand and the whole pot falls apart. And also the, the clay is different. The preparation of, of clay for a cooking pot is different. The potters would add um, quartz sand, basically, grit, that would help uh, temper the clay and transmit the heat too so that it would cook more evenly and thoroughly. Um, and that also wasn't probably quite as strong then as uh, correct, the correct, formulas. Correct, correct. Okay, so we have several examples through time of cooking pots on the uh, tables in front of us here. And Ken, I'd like to ask you to talk about these, and then let's move to something more theoretical. Then let's talk about the importance of food and the importance of cooking pots in the whole system mm. that we call food systems. Um, mm. So talk about these pots, these particular ones, uh, which come from the collections at La Sierra. Right. Um, well, we, we moved through time like we did with, with the lamps. Um, this is an early Bronze Age cooking pot. This is third millennium, contemporary mm -hmm. with the pyramids of Egypt. Um, look at the little ledge handles. We call these ledge handles. Um, poking out from the side. Most of the jars from this time period had those kinds of handles. And it's interesting that they, they put them on their cooking pot, too. If you look later, they have what we would consider more typical handles through much of the chronology, the, the time sequence that we deal with. C could they still use those ledge handles in the same way? If we're talking about holding it over a fire? Well, or they, would, they would usually nestle these in the coals. So uh. See the round bottom or... or um, when you need to lift it out, though, you, you know, use your hot pad or whatever, right, just right. lift it up by, the, by right. the ears. And this one has some interesting stippling decoration uh, yeah. around mm -hmm. the handles. Uh, is that fairly mm -hmm. typical? Or? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a form of decoration that, that shows up in the early Bronze Age, especially the later part of the early Bronze Age. So, biblical Getting, connections? Uh, well, some people place that at, uh, as the time of Abraham. But Though maybe early for some. Probably a little bit early. Yeah. Abraham probably belongs with this one. Okay, talk to us about this one. This is what we call Middle Bronze, so from about 2000 BC. Um, well, it goes down 
uh, maybe 1600, but not this far. This is the earlier part, 1800s, 1700s, which is exactly when a lot of people would, would place um, Abraham as a contemporary with Hammurabi of Babylon. Um, notice the pie crest type of decoration just a little bit below the rim. This is a dead giveaway for a Middle Bronze Age mm. cooking pie. T talking about that, I noticed that the Caltrans have, has used the same thing on the freeway uh, along the side. <laughs> yeah, they've got this pie crust. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe the cook. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a this is a, a great example of a cooking pot from the time of Abraham. Mm -hmm. You just about see Sarah cooking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meal. It's a different shape though than any of these. Now, why the flat? I'm going to say flat-ish mm -hmm. bottom. Um, well, again, it would it would nestle on the coals. Okay. Rounded is more typical. If one wants to make a connection, in the early Bronze Age, most of the jars were flat-bottomed, mm -hmm. but they're not as durable. The flat bottoms break out more easily than the egg-shaped bottom. So maybe we had the same sort of idea going with these, and they then later stuck with a more rounded bottom to their cooking pots. And these things change over time for reasons of what? Um, beauty? Function? Uh, the obvious mistakes mm. with previous designs? What sorts of things in form? Well, anthropologists um, think that, that items associated with cuisine um, are sort of um, close um, cultural identifiers. So there's this connection with food. How did your mother cook? What did the food taste like? And the sort of the kind of dish that it might be served in could be connected with that. But other aspects of, of these vessels just change with style, like hairstyle. Mm -hmm. So the rims, mm -hmm. it's just it's just style. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are typical of the Iron Age, the time of the Israelite kings. Um, this is probably earlier, maybe 10th, 9th mm -hmm. century. Uh, this is a little bit later. Uh, 8th, 7th uh, mm -hmm. uh, century. So the time of David here and Solomon, and mm -hmm. here would be a Jeremiah, Isaiah. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe getting down even to Ahab mm -hmm. and Armour, but yes, mm -hmm. Isaiah, mm -hmm. Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, it looked like it was going to tip there. <laughs> we have to be careful. These, uh, they're a few thousand years old. So. <laughs> right. I'll come back to these, these um, pieces. Okay, so what do we have over here then? Um, we, this one is getting down into the Hellenistic or the Greek period. Um, it, we have a style like this in Judah, so the mm -hmm. southern part of, of Israelite territory, um, that begins to look like this really about the time of, of Jeremiah, maybe a little earlier. Sort of this bag shape, this yeah. elongated, fairly closed top. But the rim here um, really does say it's, it's Hellenistic. Mm -hmm. um, then when we get down into the Roman and Byzantine period, it has a similar fairly high or thin rim, but you get the ribbing on the body. Standard, That's, what, late Roman? Yeah. So we're talking about third, fourth century? Sure. Um, and Byzantine. then into Byzantine, which runs, depends on which part of the world you're in, mm. but in our part of the world runs till, what, seventh century? Mm. Um, right. And so we've got quite a bit of time, several centuries, where this type of ribbing is used. And is that decorative or is that structurally significant? Well, um, <laughs> it's very thin. The Roman Byzantine pottery is very thin. So it may be that the texturing helps strengthen the walls of the vessel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't you find this one um, yourself on the excavation? Yeah, it is mm -hmm. from, from the excavations. From Tel el in right. Jordan, mm -hmm. and has been pieced together. We seldom find whole vessels. Uh, we find mostly pieces, and usually we find scattered pieces here and there, and you may or may not be able to put something mm -hmm. together. Sometimes, as in uh, the case with, uh, I don't remember if this was the, it was the case here, but with some vessels, th the whole building has collapsed, either violently or um, some violent cause or whatever, maybe just a fire accidentally, but has collapsed, and everything that was on the floor has just smashed and kept there. Mm -hmm. So you can at least put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, we don't find them that way either. If they are whole, chances are they're from a tomb, right? Right. It has protected it through time. It could be a funerary meal mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. relatives ate and then they mm -hmm. ate the vessels. Okay, so then, what does that mean about people's beliefs? Uh, yes. There must have been some idea of an afterlife, uh, and they sort of a farewell meal to wish mm -hmm. them <laughs> onward their, with their journey mm -hmm. to the afterlife. Right. Now, there are people who argue that 
in the Old Testament period, a sense of a future life was pretty limited. Mm -hmm. um, but even there, there are vessels. There um, are. And pretty much goods. with, yeah, and, and grave goods. And with the uh, new stela from Zinderly, that in, in that idea a bit, bit hard. Mm -hmm. Because it speaks of the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Right, right. They talk about the gathering to your fathers, right? When, right. when people are buried. Right. So the idea is that you go to the ancestral burial ground and bring them together. Mm -hmm. And one of the, of the um, finds at Tel Amari again, mm -hmm. uh, the dolmen tomb from mm -hmm. 3000, so we're talking about the uh, first jar mm -hmm. over here, um, had the skeletal remains, which have been rediscovered recently <laughs> um, in lab cases, so that was exciting. Um, but they were um, mixed these skeletal parts of, of 20 individuals were mixed with 19 or 20 artifacts like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even in secondary burials, mm -hmm. where the bones had been gathered to the mm -hmm. ancestors, mm -hmm. um, the pots came along, the vessels mm -hmm. came along, the, even small storage vessels, mm -hmm. to make sure there's enough food. Mm -hmm. So there's, there has to be some kind of belief connection mm -hmm, here, mm -hmm. and uh, some sense of hope for uh, yeah. the future. Now, what would be cooked in these, and how do we know? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's think first of all about the meals. Breakfast was pretty light, bread and maybe some fruits. Mm -hmm. They'd go out to the fields and work. They would take, for lunch, bread <laughs> and probably parched grain, maybe olives, maybe some dried figs. Mm -hmm. The main meal would be, after they come back, maybe dusk mm -hmm. in the evening, and that's when they would use the cooking pot. Uh, they would cook a stew, usually of some kind, and then dip bread mm -hmm. in the stew. Mm -hmm. You have bread three meals a day. Um, the cooking pot would, would provide for the main meal. Um, how do we know what was in the residue analysis? Actually, we're able to, um, to test for certain lipids and other mm -hmm. uh, traces of food. So you can identify whether there was uh, milk that was cooked in this vessel, or a meat meal or uh, vegetable remains, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can get some idea of, uh, of the meals. In fact, we have a specialist uh, that uh, is now, I think she's teaching, she went to school at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, mm -hmm. and part of her research was to take some of our cooking pot rims, just the broken, mm -hmm. broken pieces, just fragments, and study them and could determine vegetable, uh, this is meat, mm -hmm. this one's dairy. Um, so, even fragments, uh, because of the seepage of what the lipids into the into the into the pottery fabric itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, now that raises another question, a very significant question. The anthropologists and other scientists asked us to think about the role of food and food preparation in ancient society at large, mm -hmm. uh, in what we call food systems research. And if we think about food system, and you think about collecting or gathering or growing food, you think about uh, preparing it, you think about consuming it, you think about disposing it, you think about storing, well, I mentioned storing. Protecting you, you, it. And protecting <laughs> all of those things, well, from the animals yeah, and from everything. Yeah. So you've got all of these activities. And some people would argue, some of our colleagues mm -hmm. have, I think quite successfully, mm -hmm. that the care for food was, if not the major central concern, occupying the majority of typical householders in antiquity, mm -hmm. was certainly up there on the list. Both male and female. <laughs> That's right, both male and female. And mm -hmm. so food systems, these are part of food systems. These mm -hmm. are part of that process. And of course, with cooking pots, it's preparing. Mm. It's preparing. So, Kent, we have some uh, biblical passages. Uh, we want to think about these connections, uh, artifacts with uh, biblical material. And this is the first one from Ecclesiastes. What does this one say? For like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know that the word for cooking pot in Hebrew is seer. And there's a lot of sounds here, uh, alliteration in this, in this saying. And um, the crackling of thorns, thorns, serim, under a pot, seer. Mm -hmm. So you can just hear this. Mm -hmm. And then kaseel, yeah. the word for fool. So a lot of, of these sounds. Um, but it's, it's quite illustrative, too, <laughs> of situations we've probably been in that we could uh, relate to this, yeah. this scene. 
<laughs> and so you've got the crackling and the laughter. Mm -hmm. And how long do thorns burn under, uh, under a well, pot? Yeah, you think about fuel for these cooking pots. Um, they didn't just chop down oak trees and use the, the big logs to, to cook their, <laughs> their dinners. The thorn bushes, they're dry, they mm -hmm. burn quickly and hot. So you just gather you know, a dry thorn bush and you can uh, cook a meal. And, and so it would last it would burn very quickly. Yeah, a few minutes. In fact, bring Thorny Burnett, I think, is mm -hmm. the scientific name mm -hmm. for at least some of those mm -hmm. bushes we have mm -hmm. in Jordan. Um, so it would go quickly, like the crackling of thorns under a pot. So what about the laughter of fools? How long would that last? <laughs> I mean, this, this is at so many levels. Mm -hmm. This is such, I mean, okay, it's serious, but it's a fun mm -hmm. kind of, uh, of proverb. Mm -hmm. uh, and that and that the bush you mentioned, the Thorny Burnett, is probably the, the Syrah right. bush mm -hmm. that is Right. Mm -hmm. alluded right. to here. Right, right. Okay, so we look at another one. This is from Exodus. Yes, the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and <laughs> ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. <laughs> so again, the flesh pots, it's using the word seer right. for cooking. They were tired of the manna, weren't they? <laughs> yep, this, and then this is where the the um, quail or quail, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we are archaeologists, and we excavate certain things like cooking pots. And because of our training in uh, biblical backgrounds, we also look for the connections. Mm -hmm. The people who wrote these things, they weren't so interested in what what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. These are just very much incidental. I mean, mm -hmm. it's descriptive, mm -hmm. um, but now. We have to go through the Bible to find these things, and, and this is this would just be to write about. Mm -hmm. We're excited because we found one of those things <laughs> or something like it, mm -hmm. and so our Which interest actually comes maybe at a different level. Mm -hmm. I can feel a little sympathy for them. The Egyptians <laughs> ate well. Think of the black, silty soil of the Nile, the right. vegetables, the leeks, right. and the right. onions, mm -hmm. and then you come to, you know, Palestine, and what do you have? You know, it's yeah. the the bread Rocky. that we just talked about, and, and maybe some, you know, parched grain. Right, 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 right. So, Okay, let's look at another one. This one from Second Kings. Yes, when Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the company of prophets was sitting before him, he said to his servant, put the large pot on and make some stew for the company of prophets. So the large pot would have presumably been quite a bit bigger than, mm. than one of these. But it would have been that shape. But it would probably. have been that shape, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go to the next slide that illustrates this. Text. Well, before we do that, um, so stew, what do we suspect? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the Hebrew what's word the, is there. What's uh, in the stew? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what's, what's in the stew? What's in the pot? Yeah, yeah I've forgotten right now. Would this um, typically but, be but vegetables? Various vegetables, right. Uh, typically mm -hmm. so. But feast times? And then they would dip the bread in the stew. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And if we were talking like uh, particularly one of our colleagues who is connected with lots of other colleagues to mm -hmm. think not just about sitting down and eating dinner, but feasting. Mm -hmm. um, time periods um, wrapped around religious or social events and mm -hmm. gatherings. And so you'd have a lot of cooking going mm -hmm. um, because you had lots of people. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a family that we're no. talking about mm -hmm. here. It's different kinds of social contexts. And here you're talking about a school where there yes. presumably were several uh, right. you know, students right. with their teacher. And apparently there was one student that didn't know his wild plants very well. So this is then <laughs> where the one goes out and, and gets some something that's not very edible. Um, and there's some thought that it's that it's this wild gourd that uh -huh. picture up here. Um, there, nazid, that's the word for vegetables too. You uh -huh. just asked yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again they would have the bread to go with the nazid and, and some of the other um, available items to put in the, the stew would be legumes. That is lentils and fava beans and chickpeas. So no, mm -hmm. no beans like we think of bean soup. Mm -hmm. Those are from the Americas, from the New World. But the flat beans, the fava beans, chickpeas, and then your greens. And you go out to forage what you can mm -hmm. find. Mm -hmm. And this particular assemblage this is, is from Rehov yes. on uh, in the Jordan Valley. Um, but and on this is side. actually where Elisha yes. is from that region. Right. 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 And those vessels are from exactly the time of Elisha. So this is what. They it's a nice available. assemblage to illustrate the types of vessels that that Elisha, that his family, that uh, the school of the his, prophets, the school of the prophets yeah. would use for storing grain. Mm -hmm. You've got some storage vessels there yeah. as well as cooking and so on. 
That's a great assemblage uh, mm -hmm. coming from an important site. Okay, Ezekiel, I did my dissertation mm -hmm. in Ezekiel, and I did my dissertation on citations of either the prophet would cite himself or he'd cite the people and then respond. So you're into one of those. This is your own territory. But we'll see how I do. No, no, you, you tell us about it. <laughs> they say, so it's following from an earlier context we can go back to, but the time is not near to build houses. The city is the pot and we are the meat. <laughs> That's not very encouraging. Uh, now, in, in my dissertation, I talked about some of these citations, we mm -hmm. call them citations, and that the prophet may have helped shape the citations just a bit so that then he could come back and hammer fairly hard. And so here are the people saying, we're in the middle of this pot. Mm -hmm. um, some scholars say that people probably wouldn't admit it quite that readily, but, but it certainly works because mm -hmm. then uh, Ezekiel can come back and say, yes, you are in trouble. There are very few prophetic books that come down as hard on people, on the people of Israel, as Ezekiel does. Mm -hmm. um, nor are there very many prophets that, that, that are exuberant about hope for the future mm -hmm. than Ezekiel. It'd be like sitting so. in a pot looking out over the walls of Jerusalem, <laughs> I guess. The Babylonians and, are coming. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and I've been there, and we'll yeah, come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I said, well, this is from Micah, right? Yes. And I said, listen, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the houses of Israel, should you not know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off my people and the flesh off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off them, break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a kettle, like flesh in a cauldron. Mm -hmm. So here we have the same word seer being translated different ways. Right, and in this case, uh, the prophets seldom minced words, mm -hmm. and I didn't mean Minced to use the word, I, <laughs> I really did not mean that, but in any case. <laughs> mince people um, too. <laughs> that, yeah, this is mince me. Um, but this is, this. Uh, a number of scholars have said this comes from Micah, who was one of the poor, mm -hmm. and he was so agitated with the way, um, especially the mercantile leadership in, um, in Jerusalem were treating the mm -hmm. poor, that he actually got things out of order. And if you look at this, tear the skin off my people. I mean, this, this, is, mm -hmm. this is taking the poor and cooking them for dinner. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But things get out of order. Um, flaying the skin off, eating them before we even cook them. See, mm -hmm. so, so it's even out of order here. And people have argued that that says something about the, the kind of the, the emotional investment mm -hmm. that Micah had in the way he felt that the very small wealthy class mm -hmm. was, treating, um, was treating the poor, of, of which group he was a part. Mm -hmm. I think you know, the, the cooking pot, it touches home. I mean, it's close to people's mm -hmm. existence. Mm -hmm. and the, the analogies with the cooking pot would, would relate. Right, right. We can, we can, you know, I'm reminded of politicians today in certain parties talking that way about other leaders and other parties. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, times don't, don't really change, do they? Right. right. <laughs> we, we assume that with the prophets, I mean, they may have made mm -hmm. good politicians. They were mm -hmm. certainly good orators. Right, right. Um, and the poetry mm -hmm. is exquisite. I mean, the, po mm -hmm. the, the prophets were poets. They were. Extremely powerful. And maybe it's just for effect that he changes the order here, but the effect, it, it, it's, you don't miss it because mm -hmm. they're, they're starting to chew on the mm -hmm. bones of the poor mm -hmm. before they've actually allowed them mm -hmm. to cook up and mm -hmm. to be finished. So, And Micah, of course, is the one who goes on in chapter 6 to say what God expects of us, doesn't he? Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's connected with how you treat right. the poor. It's right. a social, social mm -hmm. justice issue. Kent, what do we have here? Well, I should come back to these um, fragments of cooking pots here. These are what we excavated also on our, on our dig in uh, Tel Elu Mary. Um, and actually, this one would fit about here. It's a late Bronze Age cooking pot up, up like this. And this one would be a little bit later, maybe in the mid uh, 12th, 12th century, 1150 BC. Judges, time of the judges. The time of the judges, yeah. Um, but what we do when we find these, I mentioned that I like cooking pots because they change quickly over time. But we scan them back at the, at the lab at La Sierra University. We scan them with a 3D laser scanner and actually then create a file that you can rotate and you can look 
on your computer, you can look at all sides of it. Here, you see the scanning and process and sweeping it with the, with the lasers to get the, the point cloud. And here, it's partly formed on the, on mm -hmm. the screen. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next one, you can see then the pottery plates that we make. And these mm -hmm. are the bread and butter of um, archaeological publications right. because everybody wants to know <coughs> what pottery you, you found in a, in a given layer because that's how you tell the time period and how it relates to other sites. Now, are these pieces that are represented on these photos? Um, this one isn't, but yes, this one is. This one, this is. one um, actually is probably the other half of... Actually, we cut some of these because yeah. of um, the desire to look at the core, but it's probably the other half of that one. Mm -hmm. And then I think we can, one. yeah, and we can determine the diameter. So these would be very large uh, cooking pots for the whole family. Mm -hmm. So what difference does it make that we can now see some examples of cooking pots? We've talked about them scientifically, and we've looked at some biblical passages. So what does the archaeology of cooking pots do for our understanding of the Bible and Bible culture? How do we think about that? I mean, the passages in many ways speak for themselves. I mean, the crackling of the thorns. It's such, it's such mm -hmm. a, I mean, it's such a fun one, but it isn't. I mean, it's a very serious one. So, so many stories in the Bible revolve around the home life, the domestic. Uh, of course, we have the kings and the battles mm -hmm. and sort of the, the high right. level of history. Right. But yeah, the, the stories about a home and hearth, or hearth and home. Uh, and nothing illustrates that better, I think, than the meals. And the cooking pots are really at the, the center of that. And is then something turned on its head by the prophet who says, you are the meat, or, the, or Ezekiel is citing the people, we are the meat, that we now have a judgment. It's not, it's not cooking for dinner. It's not mm -hmm. sustenance and nourishment. It's judgment. Mm -hmm. So how, you know, that's another kind of message that is layered. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's another way of saying something serious. Mm -hmm. And it's not positive anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's turned on its head. Yeah. It shows us how the Bible really grows out of everyday life of the people, as well as special events, of course, that we read about. But it has a context, a historical context, all these passages that we read. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So a number of cooking pots important for our understanding archaeologically, mm -hmm. but also connections biblically. And when we look at them and we feel them, we are transported to these stories All and right. we think, at least we yeah. think, that there's <laughs> more to them. So thank you, Kent, and thank you, Larry. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope it's been helpful in uh, giving enlightenment to the mind and food for your soul. And we certainly look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.